the government's sustainability and transformation plans for the National Health Service hide £22 billion of cuts from our service, according to research by the BMA. That risks, and I quote, starving services of resources and patients of vital care. That comes from Dr Mark Porter of the BMA. When he calls this process a mess, where is he wrong? The National Health Service is indeed looking for savings within the NHS, which will be reinvested in the NHS. It is, and it, I would remind the Right Honourable Gentleman that it is this Government that is providing not just the £8 billion of extra funding the NHS requested, but £10 billion of extra funding requested by the National Health Service. And the sustainability and transformation plans are being developed at local level in the interests of local people by local commissions. It's, a very, it's very strange the Prime Minister should say that, Mr Speaker, because the Health Select Committee, chaired by our honourable friend, the member for Totnes, says it's actually £4.5 billion, not £10 billion. There's quite, a big, there's quite a big difference there. And Mr Speaker, part of the reason for the strain on our National Health Service is that more than one million people are not receiving the social care that they need. As a result of this, there's been an increase in emergency admissions for older patients. Margaret wrote to me this week saying, it's not funny. She described how her 89-year-old mother suffered two falls leading to hospital admissions due to the lack of nursing care and went on to say, my mother is worth more than this. What action will the Prime Minister take to stop the neglect of older people, which ends up in forcing them to take A&E admissions when they should be cared for at home or in a care home? Well, of course social care is an area of concern and social care is a key issue for many people. That's why the Government has introduced the Better Care Fund. That's why the Government has introduced the social care precept for local authorities. And and we're encouraging the working together of the health service and the local authorities to deal with precisely the issues he's raised on social care and bed blocking. But I will just say this to the right honourable gentleman. Uh, we've introduced the Better Care Fund and the social care precept. Let's just look at what Labour did in their 13 years. They said they'd, they said they'd deal with social care in the 97 manifesto introduced a Royal Commission in 1999, a Green Paper in 2005, the Oneness Review in 2006, said they'd sought it in the CSR of 2007, and another Green Paper in 2009. Thirteen years and they did nothing. Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister well knows, health spending trebled under the last Labour government. Levels of satisfaction with and the levels of satisfaction with the National Health Service were at their highest ever in 2010. This government's choice was to cut social care by £4.6 billion in the last Parliament, at the same time as they found the, re the space, shall we say, to cut billions in corporate taxation bills. That means it's affecting patients leaving hospital as well. In the last four years, the number of patients unable to be transferred from hospital due to the lack of adequate social care has increased by one third. Will the Prime Minister ensure her government guarantees all of our elderly people the dignity they deserve? I recognise the importance of caring for elderly people and providing them with the dignity that they deserve. It's, uh, he, says, he says that this government has done nothing on social care. I repeat, we've introduced the social care precept. That is being made use of by my local authorities and by his local authority. Uh, we've also introduced the Better Care Fund. But if he talks about support for elderly people, I would remind him which government is it that has put the triple lock in place for pensioners? That's ensured, that's ensured the largest increase in pensions for elderly people. The precept is a drop in the ocean compared to what's necessary for social care. And give you an example, Mr Speaker, the whole House, I'm sure, would have been appalled by the revelations in BBC Panorama programme this week, showing older people systematically mistreated. The Care Quality Commission's assessment that care homes run by the Morley Group 
require improvement and has issued warning notices. The Commission goes on to say that the owner has allowed services to deteriorate further and has, and I quote, utterly neglected the duty of care to the residents of these homes. What action is her government going to take to protect the residents of those homes? The, the the right honourable gentleman mentioned raises the issue of the quality of care that is provided in homes and the way in which elderly people are treated. I'm sure everybody is appalled when we see examples of poor and uh, uh, terrible treatment that is given to elderly and vulnerable people in care homes. What we do about it is ensure that we have the CQC which is able to step in, which takes action, which has powers to make sure that nobody Nobody in the chain of responsibility is immune from legal accountability. But we know that there's more that can be done, and that's why the CQC is looking into ways in which it can improve its processes, increase its efficiency. The, uh, my honourable friend, the Minister for Community Health and Care, is going to be writing to the CQC shortly to look at how we can see to improve what they do. It's the CQC that deals with these issues. We have that in place. Is there more we can do? Yes, and we're doing it. Jimmy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, the problem seems to be that that home was understaffed and we shouldn't be blaming often underpaid and hard-pressed care workers. We should be ensuring there are enough of them properly paid in all of those homes. There was a serious problem of understaffing and it was the last Labour government that established the CQC and I think a warning notice is insufficient. We need stronger action than that. Absolutely. Yesterday, Mr Speaker, the government proposed that patients may have to show passport to other uh, ID to access non-emergency health care. Has the government considered that the impact of this on elderly people, the last census showed us that nine and a half million people in this country don't have passports. Rather than distracting people with divisive and impractical policies, could the Prime Minister provide the NHS and social care with the money that it needs to care for the people who need the support? Over the course of this Parliament, the Government will be spending half a trillion pounds on the National Health Service. The Right Honourable Gentleman asks about a process to ensure that people who are receiving NHS treatment are entitled to receive that NHS treatment. For many years there has been a concern about health tourism, about people turning up in the UK, accessing health services and not paying for them. We want to make sure that those who are entitled to use the services are indeed able to see those free at the point of delivery, but that we deal with health tourism and those who should be paying for the use of our health services. Mr Speaker, Sir Simon Stevens said that, uh, told us two weeks ago that the next three years are going to be the toughest ever for NHS funding and that 2018 would see health spending per person cut for the first time ever in this country. And the NAO reported that the cost of health tourism is over a hundred times less than the 22 billions of cuts the NHS is facing from this government. The reality is, Mr Speaker, under this government, there are 6,000 fewer mental health nurses. There are record 3.9 million people on NHS waiting lists. All of us who visit A&E departments know the stress the staff are under and that the waiting time is getting longer and longer. And that there are 1 million people in this country not receiving the social care that they need. So instead of looking for excuses and scapegoats, shouldn't the Prime Minister be ensuring that health and social care is properly resourced and properly funded to take away the stress and fear that people face in, in old age over social care and the stress that is placed on our very hard-working NHS and social care staff? Billions of pounds extra into social care through the social care precept and the Better Care Fund. Half a trillion pounds being spent on the National Health Service. A record level of investment in mental health in the National Health Service. But there's a fundamental, yeah. but there's a fundamental point that the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, refrains from mentioning. It, it, it is this. We can only afford to pay for the National Health Service and for social care if we have a strong economy creating wealth. And that's precisely what he's going to hear from the Chancellor of the Exchequer in a few minutes' time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mr. Speaker, we on these benches have repeatedly brought up uh, the devastating impact on disabled people from the UK benefits uh, system. The Government plans to cut support for people with long-term health difficulties by £30 a week. Last week, my SNP colleague, the member for Airdrie and Shots, proposed a motion which was passed by this House with support from both Labour and Conservative <coughs> members for these cuts to be postponed. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister act on the vote of this House? Yeah. Yeah. Let me say to the Right Honourable Gentleman what we've been doing in relation to uh, benefits for disabled people. Uh, the overall funding for disability benefits will be higher in every year up to 2020 than it was in 2010. We have been focusing support on those who most need it, those who are not able to get into the workplace. For those who are able at some stage to get into the workplace, we've been providing a wider package of support. And I'm pleased to say that over the last three years, nearly 600,000 more disabled people are now in the workplace with the dignity of having a job, which is what many people with disabilities want to have. So we're focusing focusing help on those who most need it and helping those with disabilities who want to get into the workplace to do just that. Franks Robertson. The Mr Speaker, it's widely trailed that the Prime Minister will make changes impacting on benefit recipients in work. Will the Prime Minister confirm that she has no intention of helping people with disabilities and medical conditions? Why should people who are unable to earn a living be punished for their disability or illness by losing £30 a week. Does she have any intention of changing that? I have, I have just set out for the right honourable gentleman the ways in which we are providing support and help for those people's, people who have disabilities. As I said, the overall funding for spending on disability benefits will be higher in every year to 2020 than it was in 2010. But it is also important to recognise that when we give support for people with disabilities, it isn't simply about the benefit system and how much money they're given. For those in the workers, uh, the, the, those who are able to get into work, and on that part of the ESA, we provide packages which are outside of the benefits as well, because we recognise that people want the dignity of getting into the workplace. That's what we are helping people with disabilities who can work to do. And I wish he would also be honest uh, when he talks about the work-related activity group uh, in um, uh, employment and support uh, arrangements. Nobody uh, on this applies to new claims only, as he very well knows. So nobody is going to have £29 a week taken uh, away from them, however many times he says it. And he also knows uh, that this is not a standalone measure, it's part of a package. The money that will be saved is being reinvested in a £330 million yeah, yeah, yeah. package to get these people into work with targeted support to help them uh, to be ready for work.